Hello, folks, and welcome to the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Tuesday, June 30th. We are back. It has been a long layup. We have missed you all, but we are back, and we are ready to talk a little bit of Duke basketball. I am here. My name is Donald Wine, and I am Blazing DW on the forums. Here with me, as always, we have the crew back. First off, live from Denver, we have Sam Klein, a.k.a. Dev11. Sam, what's up? Donald, it is great to hear your voice. Uh, it's nice to be back with everybody. I uh, I got my national championship hat back on just just for this recording and for uh, for this episode for the first time. I have I think finally mastered my home audio recording uh, hardware, so I should sound better than I have in the past. Although I mean I'm still the same idiot I was, like, but uh, at least I'm coming through clearly. So far, so good. And you know it's it's been a long layoff, so that's one of the things that we've all been working on is. Improving our audio uh, quality, uh, and also in Atlanta, Jason, what's up, man? Yes, uh, I am Jason Evans. I'm using the same headset I've been using all along, so my audio quality has not improved at all. My content also will be the same as it's always been, which is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> you're the, you're so, the most prolific poster in the, in the history of the DBR farm. At the yes. least, you have a lot to say. Right, that is my qualification. I talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, wait, before we get to anything, Donald, Donald, aren't we celebrating a U.S. soccer, U.S. women's soccer team making the finals of the World Cup tonight? Uh, this is being recorded on uh, late on Tuesday, June 30th. The U.S. women have just qualified for the Women's World Cup final. Uh, I'm watching the U.S. men on Friday, but I will be back here in D.C. If you are in D.C., come to Laughing Man Tavern. Shameless plug. Come find me there. It is going down this Sunday. Cannot wait. Is going to be a blast. So wait, so wait. I want to tell a quick story. And and anyone who's ever recorded a Duke game will relate to this story. <laughs> so I recorded the women's game tonight uh, because I had to take my wife to the airport. And I knew I couldn't see it. I, I watched like the first 15 or 20 minutes and I recorded the rest. I walk in the door and I say to my son, I go, Alec, hey, do you want to watch the Women's World Cup soccer game with me? And he goes, why? The U.S. won. And I'm like, no! <laughs> I'm like, no! <laughs> how many, guys, how many times has that happened to you with a Duke basketball game? My dad did that to me once on a Duke Carolina game. My dad's a big Carolina fan. And he calls me up just as I'm sitting down with my DVR to watch the game. And I usually watch the Carolina game live, but I like I had stuff going on that night. He calls me up and I pick up the phone. I go, hello. He goes, congratulations. Nice win. And I went, no! <laughs> I I usually resign myself if I'm watching a game on delay or on a you know or, or like hours later. I resign myself to the fact that I will find out the score one way or the other, whether it be through Twitter or whether it be through somebody texting me or somebody just, especially if we lose, coming to gloat and rub it in. Uh, I will definitely find out. So I usually try to watch all all the games live if possible. I'm I'm actually pretty good at, at disconnecting when I have to record and watch it later. So I don't have any specific like horrible ones where I tried to stop the person. And I also, for like the people who would make their best effort to contact me after like any major Duke event, uh, I'll tell them ahead of time. I'll be like, guys, I'm not going to be on the grid tonight. Um, it's like, don't contact me. I will let you know when I've finished watching the game. Um, so I, I'm actually, I haven't had a, a moment like that anytime recently, which is good. Well, I usually go right when I when it's a Duke game, I usually go radio silent. Like the story with my father was was a, a several years ago. And I've learned since then. I just go radio silent. I won't answer the phone. I won't do anything. But the funny thing is, like my phone will, will start buzzing. I'll notice I'm getting texts or emails or something like that, like crazy. And it'll sort of tell me either it's a really close game or it's maybe a game we lost or we won by a huge margin. Because in any one of those cases, I, I you know, I'll get a ton of messages. So if like it's a bad opponent and we win by like, you know, the usual 15 to 20, then my phone won't go off at all. And I'll sort of know that that's what happened. But if my phone's going crazy, I'll know that either it was spectacular to watch or terrible to watch. Uh, I, I need to maybe just throw my phone away when I have a Duke game. And ESPN have, will actually, with their notifications, will tell you sometimes you, you don't that, want you to. You got to turn all that stuff off. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, no, no. You don't my phone off. You don't need any of that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, even have that stuff turned on for Duke because I, I figure I either know – I don't, need, I don't need ESPN to tell me. I either know or I know that I will find out later on, and I don't exactly. want ESPN to tell me. 
Yeah. yeah I, I, the other day when uh, I, I, I've mentioned this before, I think that I'm a Washington Nationals fan. And a couple of weeks ago, Max Scherzer threw a no hitter. And when it was happening, it was like on a Saturday afternoon. I was up uh, in the mountains in Colorado uh, at the Bluegrass Festival in Telluride, which is extremely fun. Um, but I was just out there sort of like relaxing and enjoying myself. And all of a sudden, um, my dad and one of my buddies start texting me furiously. They're like, you might want to turn on the Nationals game right now because I just wasn't paying attention. And I'm like, Ugh, I'm like up in the mountains. I don't get reception. So I'm like trying my hardest to like find uh, to find an Internet connection so that I could watch the last inning of the Max Scherzer no hitter, which was a perfect game when I turned it on. And then he he lost it in the ninth on a on a, uh, on a hit by pitch. So I I've like tuned in for that sort of thing, but I didn't have anything ruined for me. But let's uh, let's get to the Duke stuff. I feel like there's been <laughs> yeah. a lot of news. Yeah, we've, yeah. I mean, yeah. we've. Uh, you know what? Uh, for the people out there, it's been a, it's been a while since we've been together, so we had to catch up a little bit. So uh, hopefully, you, you know, you've you've tuned in so far, so you are bearing with us. So let's get into it. Uh, let's start with I, the end either, of the draft. Either, either that, or they fast forwarded to this moment. I mean, we do give timestamps so people can fast forward. So that's that is if true. You guys, if you guys want my full <laughs> breakdown of the Bluegrass Festival, we could do that on a separate side pod. Would that be the Duke Bluegrass? The Duke Bluegrass report? Would that is that what that would be? Oh my gosh! Yes, that's what we're calling it. That's gonna be my. That's gonna be my next project. <laughs> oh my god! You you guys are awesome. Uh, <laughs> let's 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 dive right into it. Okay, let's go to the NBA draft, uh, which was last Thursday night. Which and it was a big night for Blue Devils. We had three first round picks. For you know, I think it was the first time in quite a while we've had three first round picks. Uh, we start out with Jalil Okafor going number three to the Philadelphia 76ers, and kind of a, a slight surprise. Uh, a lot of people had pegged him to go number two to the Lakers, but he ended up going to number going number three. Justice Winslow went number ten to the Heat, and something that really, really made me angry because my Pistons at number eight decided not to take him, instead going with the most overrated player in the draft, High Stanley Johnson. Good to see you. And in at number 24, Tyus Jones actually got drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers and in a slight twist, got traded to the Minnesota Timberwolves. So he gets to go home uh, and play for his hometown team, which is actually really cool. And I think it'd be a nice little situation for him. Uh, Quinn Cook, uh, the last person who uh, was declared for the draft, uh, went undrafted, but has signed with the Oklahoma City Thunder and will play on their summer te- summer league team uh, starting next uh, this coming weekend uh, and next week. So uh, I will start with Sam. What are your thoughts on the draft and uh, where our guys went? All interesting stories, I think, this year. And we had, obviously, as you pointed out, a lot of guys who were involved in the draft this year. I think that Justice Winslow was the most interesting case because there were a number of teams, as you mentioned, that passed on him that really could have gone with him. I think starting even as, as early as like five or six, every team that that picked somebody else really was probably thinking about Winslow in, in some regard. And, and he ended up following all the way to the heat to a team that has a lot of Duke connections. They've already got Lou Dang and Josh McRoberts on the team. And, and obviously uh, Aronson is the, is the uh, team president there. So we Duke's got a lot of, you know, connections to the heat. So it's cool that justice Winslow is there on a team that, that has some kind of Duke thing going on. And it was especially notable that the Hornets um, passed on him at nine to draft Frank Kaminsky uh, the Hornets obviously are, are run by Michael Jordan, so there's there was a lot of stuff idiot. about how idiot, yeah, idiot, yeah. He mm-hmm. he was a much better basketball player, I think, than he has been a a basketball ex- executive. Um, so we'll we'll see about how that ends up coming to hurt them. But man, I feel like the Heat got one of the best players in the draft here. I think we've talked about how there's a really good chance that Justice Winslow ends up being the best player to come out of this draft. He's got so much potential. He's so athletic. He can play multiple positions. He can do a lot of stuff that's useful to an NBA team that doesn't require him to like be a star to be the center of attention, to be really effective. You know, he's got a little of that Dwayne Wade in him. He's a little Andre Iguodala in him. And I think the fact that he's going to the heat makes it cool because he's going to get to learn from Dwayne Wade and they, they play, you know, not exactly the same style, but a lot of their, you know, a lot of their moves are, are similar and a lot of their game is similar. And so I think that Dwayne Wade is going to be an awesome mentor for Justice Winslow, obviously. Well, did, did you did you hear what do you hear what Coach K said about it? No, Coach, I didn't. you want to you want to tell us? Yeah, it? Coach K. And by the way, I, I think maybe the best thing for us is let's pick a player at a time and talk about because you're right, sure. you were dead right, Sam. There are cool stories about each one of these guys. So let's start on Winslow, who's probably the best, most interesting story, most compelling one. But Coach K, before the draft, said that he thought 
Justice Winslow, the, the best NBA comparison was Dwayne Wade. Um, that, that was the comment that Coach K made. I forget who he made it to. I, you know, I, I don't remember exactly where I heard it. But Coach K thinks that Justice Winslow pretty much is Dwayne Wade, which would be an incredible, uh, you know, an incredible comparison, an incredible career for Winslow to have. But I want to go back to the Charlotte Hornets and Michael Jordan passing on him, the Detroit Pistons passing on him. Supposedly, the Boston Celtics, Danny Ainge is a very good GM. I think the Celtics, uh, you know, that's an organization, even though they didn't go, you know, they went out in the first round this year and they haven't, you know, really been a major title contender for a couple of years now. Um, I, I, you have to love the way that organization is run. And I think Danny Ainge is a very, very savvy, very smart GM. Danny they Ainge. Smart owners too. They do. Yeah, they do. Yes. <laughs> more, some Duke Duke, no, more Duke connections. No, more connections. Exactly. But uh, uh, Danny Ainge was willing to do some unbelievable things when he realized that if he just moved up a little bit in this draft, he could get Justice Winslow. Um, uh, he offered both Charlotte and Miami four number one picks, four number one picks. That is a lot, including the number 16 to go from to go from 16 to 10 or 16 to nine and give up four number one picks. He was really with, and people in his draft room were like, man, Danny, this may be offering too much, but for some reason, Charlotte didn't do it. Miami wasn't going to do it for a second because Pat Riley was like, are you kidding me? Justice Winslow's on the board. Justice Winslow's probably, you know, uh, Miami supposedly said they would have taken Winslow with like the number three or number four pick had they had it. Um, in fact, Miami supposedly was talking to the Knicks about maybe moving up to number four to get Winslow. Um, and then he fell into their lap. So Miami wasn't going to do the deal, but I don't understand Michael Jordan. I don't know what he was thinking to take Frank Kaminsky in that spot or not take the package of picks that was being offered to him. I think he could have moved down some and gotten Frank Kaminsky. If he look, he could have gone down to 15 where the Hawks were drafting and probably gotten Frank Kaminsky. I think, I mean, Kaminsky's going to be a nice player, I think, but uh, goodness gracious, taking him over justice Winslow makes no sense to me. And word is they had uh, even offered, uh, in addition to the four first-round picks, two second-round picks for a total of six picks uh, for uh, to Charlotte actually for their uh, for their spot in the draft. So yeah. there was a there was a report that there was a, uh, it was six for one essentially, and they picked Kaminsky instead. It's it's crazy. It, it is it, it's really crazy. Michael Jordan will be. Even if Kaminsky turns into a good pro, I think you'll be kicking yourself for not taking that deal. That's the kind of offer that would usually get you up to, you know, number three, number four in the draft. I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know. Jordan apparently falls in love with, if you look at his history, Jordan falls in love with um, guys who do really, really well in college, who are experienced college players. He loves drafting like college juniors, college seniors. And he also likes I, drafting Kwame Brown. Oh, God. Yeah, well, what happened was he got burned so bad on Kwame Brown that now he won't take a youngster anymore. I'm still and upset I think it, about it. it. It ruined a good part of my childhood that the that the <laughs> Bullets slash Wizards had, had Kwame Brown for all that time. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know what Jordan was thinking, but uh, Charlotte is not going to be relevant with him at the helm. That's, you know, I, I think that's just what, what we have to accept at this point. Hey, so uh, we're going to move on to another guy or, or Donald, you got something on Winslow? No, I, I, I just want to make a, a slight rant at the fact that my Pistons, once again, did not pick Justice with the number eight spot. Uh, everything fell in the line. Um, if you guys recall the NFL draft, uh, my Detroit Lions picked uh, Lincoln Tomlinson, a Duke player, and I thought everything was coming up Duke for me. I thought I was, I, I was at softball, and people are texting me saying, yo, you're about to get Justice Winslow. I jump in the car. I turn on the, I turn on the radio. And I hear Stanley Johnson's name come out of the commissioner's mouth. And I, I'm, I, I don't know why, because the first thing that came out of everyone's uh, mouth when they were talking about Stanley was that he was the most overrated player in the draft. And I quote, I'm, I'm on the way home. I'm driving home, still angry at the fact that we're picking Stanley Johnson. And the NBA radio Sirius XM staff is saying, okay, what are your takeaways from the draft so far? And the first thing without hesitation uh, this guy says is, I cannot believe we live in a world where Stanley Johnson was picked in the NBA draft before Justice Winslow. And as soon as I said that, I almost crashed my car because I was so mad that they were talking about the Pistons passing on Justice Winslow when it fell right into the lap. He worked out for them. He actually didn't work out for the Heat. The Heat kind of, uh, apparently they were focused on um, 
uh, one of the European players that that the name escapes me that was kind of lower in the draft, thinking that they were going to be available, and Justice fell into the lap, and they had a nice little powwow session about how they were going to do it, and apparently the Arisons started singing the Duke fight song in the in the war room, and that's how Pat Riley knew that's who they want they they want to pick Justice Winslow. So that's kind of a quirky little story, but I I I, I just don't know why he's not in a Pistons uniform, um, but congratulations to the heat because they, they probably got to steal a draft. Yeah. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is we can go all the way up to number four, number four, when the Knicks took Porzingis yeah. supposedly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, Oh my Poor God. Kid. Like that. that oh that my God. It was, I, I hope he's, tremendous. I hope he's as mentally strong as is humanly possible because he's going to need it. Yeah. Well, and, and everyone knows he's at least two years away from being a real contributor. So he's going to sit on the bench. Every time he comes in the game, he's going to get booed. He's not going to be a contributor. But supposedly, the reason I bring it up is when the Knicks took Porzingis at number four, supposedly they really pissed off Carmelo Anthony. And mm -hmm. because Carmelo wants to win now, he wants to at least be relevant. And picking Porzingis means that New York has decided they're not going to be relevant for a couple more years. Carmelo will be too old to be relevant by the time they are they are planning to be good in a couple of years. But um, the, all the New York papers are saying that, that the guy they should have taken was just so that was the guy to help you win right away and help out um, uh, Carmelo Anthony. And we're talking about the number four pick here. How did Winslow last to number 10? It reminds me of the draft. I want to say it was the 98 or 2001. God, I can't remember 2000, uh, something like that, where Paul Pierce, everyone said Paul Pierce was a lock to be a top five pick. And somehow he slipped to number 10 where the Celtics picked him up. If you redrafted that draft, Paul Pierce is probably the number two pick in the draft behind Dirk Nowitzki, and he went number 10. I'm telling you, you're going to look back on this draft. Justice Winslow is going to be the same way. You're going to go, how'd that guy go number 10? He should have gone number two. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Speaking of number two, Jahlil Okafor, how did he not go number two? Honestly, I you know, the entire, like, since Ja declared for the draft, he had been slated two. I believe it was immediately after he decided to turn pro uh, it came out that he did not want to go to Minnesota, um, that he wanted to uh, – he told them or, or whatever not to take him to number one, that he did – that would be a good fit, um, which is fine. Um, but after that, the Lakers were number two, and it was pretty much slated that he was going to be with the Lakers. I think, honestly, I think the Lakers just talked themselves out of drafting him because the all the way up to the morning of the draft, Jalil Okafor was their pick. And all of a sudden, people are talking about uh, uh, D'Angelo Russell and how good he's going to be and how he's going to be the best player in the draft. And I think the Lakers just talked themselves out of drafting the person that they really want to draft. Uh, I, I think Russell would fit in well with the Lakers. But I also think Justice or Jaleel Okafor uh, was going to be a star for the Lakers. I think he was ready to be a star. And I think he even he was surprised that – not only did the Lakers not pick him, but that the Sixers did, considering that the last two drafts they have picked New Orleans Noel and Joel Embiid, who are both centers, and not, none of the three can play with each other. They're all they're, None of them are, are guys that can flow out to the perimeter and take shots, and none of them are going to be where you can have two of those guys banging in the post. So I, I don't know what the Sixers' plan is. I don't think Sixers fans know what the Sixers' plan is. And I don't think Ja has been sold on that plan yet um, because I, I think that he is looking at a situation where no, none of these guys, all these guys have been promised that they are the future of the Sixers. But at the same time, you can't have your three best players play the same position. And that's exactly what the Sixers have. I, I agree with Donald on all those points. I also wanted to run back to the Knicks real quick. It sounded like the Knicks fans were really excited when the Lakers picked Russell because how could the Sixers possibly take Okafor? They already, as you point out, have two centers. And the Knicks thought that Okafor was going to fall into their laps and then it didn't happen. So it's like a, it was a comedy of errors, it seemed like, on all sides because the, the Sixers picked a player that was like the – he was the best player on the board probably – um, but one they it's like the only one they didn't need, and then uh, the Knicks didn't get a chance to take him. And I know the Knicks fans were excited about that prospect. I, I agree. It was a weird it was a weird move by the Sixers. It was a weird move by the Lakers. I think that Okafor seems like the type of guy who's got his head screwed on straight, and he's going to succeed sort of wherever he goes. You know, he's got he's got such a good fundamentally sound game on the offensive end that it's it's hard to imagine him struggling mightily anywhere, even 
you know, in a situation where maybe he's going to get fewer minutes. But um, it is going to be interesting to see what Philadelphia does because they're not going to be able to keep all those guys. Maybe the injuries with Embiid aren't are going to manifest and and just and keep being a problem. And so Ogafor will get more playing time because Embiid's never going to play. Um, but maybe they trade him or maybe they trade one of the other guys. I'm not worried about Jaleel Okafor being a featured player very soon in his career. He's got such an advanced skill set that he's going to thrive. And maybe he's only going to thrive in 20 minutes a game his first year. But I think he's going to be very good. And I think the Sixers are going to figure out how to how to use his talent effectively. You know, so I think what happened to the Lakers was – there was just so much talk about you don't need a center because we just saw the NBA championship um, be won by by a team that had Draymond Green, who I think most of us would have pegged as a small forward <laughs> um, at their center position um, for, for the most part the, for the Golden State Warriors. And so the NBA suddenly this season turned into um, a, a league where all that mattered was three-point shooting. And so everyone went, well, why am I drafting a, a – why am I drafting a center? Why am I drafting? You know, Carl Anthony Towns may play center, but he's a stretch center. He's a stretch four. Um, and a guy like Will Cauley Stein, um, who, who, who's another center who got taken very early in the draft. Well, he, you're taking him for defense the same way the Sixers did with Nerlens Noel and Joel Embiid. And people, people sort of said, well, so wait a second. Why am I drafting Jaleel Okafor to take these quote unquote inefficient two point shots in the post and not be a shot blocker? And so the Lakers talked themselves well, out. They, and because um, all those teams are looking for Tyson Chandler, right? They, yep. they, that's what they yep. all think they're getting. That's not. I mean, that's not necessarily going to happen with all these players. Yeah. Well, and and I don't know that Tyson Chandler is a piece that you build a champion. Or in fact, I'm pretty sure you don't build a champion around Tyson Chandler. And when you're picking one of the top one, two, three picks in the draft, you should be looking for a guy that you think you hope maybe maybe if you get really lucky you can build a championship around. I just think these teams, everyone's decided the NBA is different than what it what it used to be in the past. And and yeah, I guess it is. But maybe it's that because there isn't anybody who does the kind of things Okafor does anymore. Did everyone forget that Tim Duncan, I mean, Tim, Duncan's won what, four? Is it four championships? Five? Five. Five. Duncan's won five. And you can't watch Jalil Okafor play and not feel like his game reminds you a tremendous uh, – so much on the offensive end of what Tim Duncan does. I mean, Okafor doesn't won the quite... championship last year. Yeah, exactly. No, it's the... not like it's not like Tim Duncan won the championship eight or ten years ago. Like he did it last year. He did it a few years before that. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like he became irrelevant as he aged. Yeah, and and all season long we heard Okafor is the most skilled big man we've seen in college since Tim Duncan. We heard it throughout the entire season. Everyone talked about it. We talked about it in this podcast dozens of times. And then suddenly the NBA is like, oh, you know what? I don't want the next Tim Duncan. It's just crazy. It's silly. These teams are going to regret it in the end. Jaleel Okafor is going to be uh, – what? Do we think it's unlikely that Jaleel Okafor will be one of the top four or five offensive post players in the NBA – inside of the next 18 months? Do, do, I, am I crazy? I think he, I think he should be. I, I, uh, I'll almost be shocked if he's not. Yeah. So I, I don't get it. Uh, now, not to say that D'Angelo Russell isn't a fine player, but I think the Lakers, you know, they just talk themselves out of, they decided that this isn't what the NBA is, and I think they're going to end up being wrong. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I'll say this about the Sixers. The Sixers could not pass on him, even if they had, even with Embiid and Noel on the roster, they could not pass on Okafor. And what they're going to end up doing, I think, they're just going to play these. First of all, they're going to see if Embiid can play anymore. I mean, Embiid may be injured and that may be a complete waste. Um, but they'll play these guys. They'll see who's the most effective. They'll say who's doing good at what, who can work together or, or you know, who needs to be alone or whatever. And then they'll deal the ones that, that aren't quite as effective. And, and that's what the Sixers are going to do. The Sixers want to stink next year anyway. They still they, – they're, they're, they have the worst guards. They don't even have um, D-League guards on the Sixers. Um, all their uh, – you know, they're going to suck again, and they'll be at, back at the top of the lottery, and they'll get someone, and then they'll start to try and win maybe next year or the year after. Maybe that's where Quinn Cook will end up after our summer league. Yeah. By the way, speaking of Quinn Cook really quickly, the fact that he signed with Oklahoma City um, to be on their summer league team, to me, doesn't even begin to mean that he'll make the Oklahoma City roster – because uh, yeah, Oklahoma City is, has so many contracts, guaranteed contracts, that they can't – I don't think they can take any more rookies. I don't even think they have room for a single one unless a couple yeah. of guys get injured or something. Last year, so, didn't they have to stash their first-round pick in the in the D-League while paying him a guaranteed contract just because of their roster situation? Yes. 
Yep, exactly. Exactly. They yeah. did. And and so uh, this is just a chance for Quinn Cook to look good for other teams to invite him to training camp. And I really, you know, I, God, I really hope he does look good. Hey, we, we, we going to talk about Tyus for a little bit? Boy, is yeah, he sure. happy to be in, he's so happy to be in Minnesota. And I think, uh, you know, it's a really interesting situation there because there's a lot of disenchantment with Ricky Rubio. Um, and I think, um, you know, with with Tyus being the hometown kid, uh, you know, hometown kid did good, went away and won a national championship at Duke and then comes back to 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 deliver the ball to Carl Anthony Towns. I think it's a great it's just a great situation for him. He doesn't have to take the reins right away. He's going to get to, you know, sort of learn behind Rubio. And if if Rubio has a great season, great, you know, fine. So Tyus is the backup point guard and, and bides his time. But if Rubio's injured again and, and struggling, I, I could I won't be at all surprised if Tyus Jones gets a lot of starts and a lot of playing time. I think it's a it's a fabulous situation for him. He couldn't be he couldn't be happier, I bet. There was a lot of talk at the like leading up to the draft that the Houston Rockets were really interested in taking Tyus Jones. I think it was with the 18th pick, uh, and they went with Sam Bicker instead. And I thought that was going to be an interesting situation if that happened, because James Harden is like the lead guard on that team. He's obviously not going anywhere. He's signed to a max contract. He's one of the best players in the league. He was like second or third in MVP voting this year, right? Um, so if Tyus had gone there, it was very clear who was in charge of that team. In Minnesota, he, as you point out, he's playing behind a point guard in Rubio who has talent, but who has struggled a lot in the NBA. He hasn't been able to figure out his shot. You know, he's hasn't quite adjusted to the NBA the way that most, I think, analysts thought that he was going to. And as you say, Tyus Jones could end up being good enough to supplant him as the starting point guard on this team. So while it's maybe not as good of a learning experience as it would have been for him to end up in, in Houston to play behind James Harden, now he's in a position where he could really take up a, a big role really early on a team that now has now has you know a lot of big prospects. You know they've got Wiggins, they've got um, they drafted Towns, so there's a lot of talent on that team, and they they could get really good really fast. And Tyus Jones, depending on how he adjusts the NBA, and we've talked a lot about what sort of what his limitations are athletically, um, that that's a situation where he really could thrive on a team that already has a lot of athletes and maybe doesn't need him to do as much to be, to be effective. Well, and, and really quick, you know, one of the nice things about being there with the, with the guys they have um, at the, you know, that they got with the number one pick um, he knows exactly what the plan is. Everyone sort of knows what Minnesota's attack is going to be. If, if we can get out on the break, if we can get the ball in the open court, to Andrew Wiggins, we do it. And if we're in the half court, we're going to work it into Carl Anthony Towns. And, it, you know, it's sort of simple for Tyus. <laughs> and it's not entirely dissimilar to what he ran when he was at Duke, where if we get into the half court, put it into Okafor slash Towns. Oh, if we're, you know, but if we can get out and run and get the ball on the, you know, to Winslow on the break, Winslow slash Wiggins, uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing he ran at Duke and he ran it pretty darn well. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a guy who is capable of, of being in the league a long time. I mean, I think all the guys who got drafted for us in the first round this year are capable of being in the league a long time. But Tyus is probably going to have to work to work the hardest to do it. So I'm very curious to see how that works out for him in Minnesota because he, he could play a big role early, which I don't think we expected to happen. Yeah, I, I think the, the key with them trading for Tyus is – uh, Rip, Ricky Rubio has been injured a lot over the last couple of years. He hasn't really panned out in that regard, uh, especially when it comes to his shooting. He's more of a uh, – he's definitely a pass-first type of uh, point guard, but he has not really featured well when it comes to clutch shooting uh, or or just or just stretch, stretching the defense out with shooting. And I think Tyus, that's where he can shine. I think that's where he will be able to step in and really assert himself, especially on the clutch end of things. We we know he's a clutch shooter, and we know he loves the big shot and the big moments. Uh, and I think that's what uh, what Minnesota thinks they need to get back to the playoffs. Uh, I think they need somebody who can jump in and be a leader, and also when it comes down to it, can be the guy who takes the shot without fear. And that's what they're getting in Tyus Jones. It just adds icing to the cake for him that he gets to go home and play in front of his hometown uh, fans. You guys want to talk about Quinn Cook? I mean, most, I mean, I'll just add that most, most summer league uh, signings are not necessarily 
you, you sign with a team for their summer league, but it's not necessarily to join that team is to get seen by other teams. And I think that's a good look uh, for Quinn Cook to sign with uh, OKC. Uh, I don't know what their schedule is like because it depends, you know, all their schedules are kind of uh, different, but I think it's going to be really good for him to uh, get some shine in the summer league, go to both summer leagues and really uh, show his worth. And I think he'll actually latch onto a team for training camp. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with him. But as we know, I mean, he's, he's small and he's not extremely fast. He's a very good shooter and he improved a lot as a defender this year, but the all the physical skills are working against him. So obviously we're rooting for him. He's, as Coach K said, he's one of the best leaders that he's ever had in the history of the program. Um, but it's going to be a really tough uphill battle for Cook to to make it in the NBA. Well, if he doesn't make it in the NBA, I think he'll, you know, he's he's a guy who's got enough skills um, that he's going to find a spot in some league. He's going to he's going to get paid to play. Um, but I think we're going to see Quinn Cook on the Duke sidelines as an assistant coach very soon after uh, his, his during, playing days are over. During the Capel regime, you mean? <laughs> we're, we're, we're not going there. We're not speculating about that. Yet, are we? I, I, no speculation. I, I, no speculation. I take it back. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> you mean the Shire, I think it's going to be the Shire regime, by the way. Ah, oh, that's <laughs> plot thickens. You're going. Hey, you're hey, going really young on that one. Hey, before we get done with the draft, uh, I, I just had one parting draft thing I wanted to mention, um, which is, you know, people get all hung up during recruiting. Um, as to whether a kid's going to be one and done or not. Uh, and we've talked about it a lot. And, and you know, we, uh, we've talked, I've talked at great length about guys who, oh, we thought for sure they'd be one and done and then they weren't, or, uh, you know, or, or guys that we could never foresee being one and done who then turned out to be one and done both at Duke and at other schools and such. Um, I want to talk for just a real quick second about Cliff Alexander. Um, oh, who, no. Um, hang on, hang on. Uh, a, a year ago at this time, Cliff Alexander, there, there were some people who said Cliff Alexander was better than Jalil Okafor, that Cliff Alexander was the number one player in high school. Most people had him number two. Most people had him number two, number three. Um, and, uh, and and he clearly, uh, he ran into some eligibility problems because his family may have, been, may have had their hand out a little bit. There were, there were some, uh, some ugly allegations and his season at Kansas was aborted and never really came to fruition the way he wanted it to. And, uh, you know, the, the Kansas coaches never really got a lot of confidence in him. I think that they always suspected that they were not going to be able to use him because he had eligibility problems with the NCAA. But this time a year ago, heck, uh, as recently as like November, December uh, of this past year, if you looked at mock drafts, Cliff Alexander was always in the top five for sure. In fact, there were lots of them that had him as high as number two, number three um, in the mock drafts. Cliff Alexander went undrafted last week in the NBA draft. Um, I, you know, I haven't really paid attention that much to know who he may have signed. I'm sure he signed on with some summer league team. Um, I don't know if Cliff Alexander is going to make it in the NBA or not. But but I don't know that we've seen anyone take a swoon like this from uh, a clear consensus top three player in the class to undrafted in the course of a year. Uh, I'll tell you. Again, I'll t actually, I'll tell you who. I'll tell you one other person you can talk about. Aaron Harrison, same thing. He was probably top five in last year's draft with his brother and did not get drafted in this year's draft. Well, wait, wait, wait. If he'd come out last year, he would not have been top five. The The Harrison twins, if they'd come out last year in the NBA draft, would have been fringe first rounders, maybe late first rounders. No, they were slated as top five picks last year. And that was before the NCAA tournament when – Andrew actually was supposed to be the lesser of the two. And because of the NCAA tournament he had last year, actually went ahead of his brother. But they both were slated as early, as late as like mid-June of last year to be in the top five, maybe top ten of the NBA draft. And this year, Aaron, uh, Andrew Harrison was – I don't know where he was picked. He was picked late in the second round, and his brother was not picked at all. But – they both were slated as first round picks last year. A Andrew was the number 44, the 44th pick in the draft, yeah. sort of the middle, middle of the second round. Um, and, and, and you know what? You're right. That's a, that's a very good comparison because they were both top five high school recruits. Uh, it took them two years to come out. Um, but uh, yeah, another one who, so, so when everyone's talking about Brandon Ingram being a lock to be 
you know, a, a lottery pick next year or all these other guys who currently are in high school and are, are going to Bobby Simmons and all these other guys who are going to be, you know, lock lottery picks next year. Cliff Alexander. That's, you know, that's the name that we, that's one of the names that, <laughs> along with the Harrisons and some others that, that we now can put up there and say, yeah, you know what? Everyone knew until, you know, it didn't happen. So, and, and right. on the flip side, if we if we want to go on the positive spin, there were a number of guys drafted in the first round who stuck around a little while in college. Uh, we talked a little bit about Frank Kaminsky all the way at, at number nine, and his teammate Sam Decker, who only left after his uh, junior year. He was the 18th pick. Jerry and Grant, who we saw this year in the ACC playing for Notre Dame, who was awesome. Um, he got drafted with the 19th pick, and he's unfortunately going to the Knicks. Um, but but another first round pick, Justin Anderson, who we saw a lot of at Virginia and and was their was their best player, I think, when he was when he was healthy. Um, you know, the, the first round was littered with guys who did stick around and ended up improving their stock and and project apparently to be to be decent NBA players. Yeah, and, and there may be no one who improved their stock more over the course of the past year than Jerry and Grant, who uh, yeah, that guy that guy was awesome this year in the in the ACC. Yeah, yeah, uh, just a great, great season, and and really nice to see him, um, you know, get uh, get his just rewards. Uh, although he's going to New York, <laughs> but he did win his bet with Jer- with his brother Jeremy over who would be selected higher in the first round. Uh, apparently, they made a sizable wager, and uh, and and Jerry and actually won that. And and for a long time, I know I've read about this that Jerry and Grant is older than Jeremy. And he was always sort of upstaged by him. It was always perceived that Jeremy had a little bit more talent. He went to a little bit better of a basketball school in Syracuse. He was taller. He had a little bit more projectable NBA skills. But and Jerry and Grant got so much better this year at Notre Dame. And and you can you can envision uh, a future where he's going to have a long NBA career where he's where he's a really effective combo guard for somebody. Um, so yeah, I, I I really like watching him play, and I'm not going to miss having to play against him at Notre Dame. Uh, and by the way, um, neither one of them were taken as high in the draft as – oh, actually, uh, Harvey's their father, right? Yeah, Harvey is Harvey's their father, their, yes. Yeah, I, don't, I forget Not where Harvey Horace. went. Hor- Horace went like fifth in the draft. Um, Horace was their Har- father. Yeah, right, Harvey right, right, right. was in the next draft. He was in the following draft. They didn't come out the same year. Right, but um, – I forget where Harvey was drafted, but uh, oh, you know what? I just looked up. Harvey was drafted twelfth, so none of the kids did as well as the dad. The dad did better than the kids. <laughs> Unlike Justice Winslow, who I think who I think did better than his dad in the draft. I think I'm not positive. Yeah, yeah. That. Ricky Ricky Winslow was like a late first round pick. Yeah, yeah. I think cool. someone will correct me. I'm sure. Yeah, well, we we'll we get the corrections quickly. All right, let's okay. let's move to something else. What do you got, Donald? So let, let's ver- let's touch very quickly on other Dukies in the NBA. These are uh, there was a couple of trades that uh, sent Dukies uh, across country. Uh, first, Joe traded from the Charlotte Hornets uh, to the Portland Trailblazers, and not to be uh, left out there alone, Mason Plumlee was traded as well from the Brooklyn Nets, also to the Trailblazers. Um, so there, there's actually a nice little uh, Dukie contingent brewing on the West Coast in Portland. Also, we had thoughts about uh, uh, Luol Deng and where he was going to go in free agency. Out at the last minute, uh, uh, j- just yesterday, he exercised his option. Uh, his his player option, I believe, was about ten million dollars to stay with the Miami Heat. So he will be there next year. But it's just a guessing game as to whether uh, his teammate Dwayne Wade will stay in Miami as well. But uh, we have a nice little Dukey contingent uh, brewing as well with uh, the Miami Heat with uh, 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 Mick Roberts and uh, Justice Winslow, and now uh, Deng will stay as well. Thoughts on uh, those trades and and Deng staying? I hope I hope that the situation in Portland goes better for Plumlee and Henderson than it did for our our friend of the podcast Nolan Smith. Um, but Plumlee and and Henderson have both obviously carved out really nice NBA careers for themselves. Mason in particular recently. Yeah, this year I think showed a lot of talent, and I think that they're both going to be useful players for Portland, who wants to be competitive in that in that tough Western Conference. So I like that. And then on the Miami side, um, I think Luol Deng is Justice Winslow. I think you know we talked about Dwayne Wade. Justice Winslow had an interview on the Dan Patrick Show. I think it was linked on the forum this morning or yesterday, 
and he talked about how important it was that he was playing on a team that that embraces what what we're now calling positionless basketball, which is a thing that the Heat really made popular when they had LeBron James. And Justice Winslow kind of fits into that style very well. Luol Deng fits it really well. Dwayne Wade, who, I, I, as you said, hasn't re-signed yet, but is, you know, for all intents and purposes, is, uh, going to re-sign with the Heat. It's just a matter of how much he's going to get paid. Um, that's going to be a really interesting team to watch. They, you know, they they kind of flirted with, with being a, a productive team this year. I think that they could get a lot better. So I think that, that the Duke guys who moved around, uh, or who you know had we had questions about. I think they all ended up in good situations for them. I mean the the Hornets and the and the Nets weren't really going anywhere. Um, so it's it's good to see Henderson and Plumlee get out of those situations and into and into a, a program that seems like it's got it's got a good direction. We'll see what happens with them with their impending free agents. You know the 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 situation with the Portland front line, um, uh, you know with their bigs uh, could be really interesting. Rob Lopez is, is a free agent. Um, Portland would like to re-sign him, but there's lots of talk that he may be going elsewhere. Boston really thinks that they're going to be able to sign Robin Lopez. Um, and uh, LaMarcus Aldridge um, has made it pretty clear that he does not want to come back to Portland. Uh, there could be a lot of time, a lot of minutes um, on the Portland front line available for Mason Plumlee. Uh, and uh, Damian Lillard, you know, people don't, Portland's sort of way out there on the West Coast in a small market um, and, you know, in the wrong time zone and playing out uh, out west so people don't hear that much about them. Damian Lillard, you can make a pretty good argument that he's the best point guard in the NBA. He's, he's certainly in the conversation. If I was Mason Plumley, I would be quite, quite content uh, to be getting big minutes uh, with Damian Lillard feeding me the ball and, and getting lots of slam dunks. I think it could be a great situation for him, a really good situation for him. Um, and I also I kind of like when our Dukies – tend to congregate on, on just a few different teams. And we, we've got, we've got Miles Plumlee um, on Milwaukee now, along with Jabari Parker. We, we've got, um, we've got Dukies uh, in Miami. We've got Dukies in Portland. It's kind of fun when there are a bunch of them on, on the same teams, because it makes it easier if you don't have a huge NBA rooting interest to know who to root for Miami, especially, I think there are going to be a lot of Duke fans really following what goes on in Miami um, uh, to see what happens with justice, Lowell and uh, Josh McRoberts. They're, they've got three uh, Duke players who have a collective four years of college experience. Wow. They're still Dukies. They're still Dukies. Oh, I, I, I embrace them nonetheless. 1% <laughs> equals 100%. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, no, it's cool, though. I, I, I agree with you, Jason. I like when, they're, when we have multiple guys on the same team. Um, just makes them a little bit easier to root for. And I'm, you know, I'm, I say I'm a Wizards fan, but I also like watching all the Duke guys in the NBA and following what's going on with them. So that, that is really cool. And and now Mason Plumlee and Gerald Henderson finally get to play together because Gerald gave up that opportunity to get drafted to the NBA uh, in the 2009 draft. So they they finally get to play on a team they, they you know together. That's right. Oh, isn't that adorable? Hey, let's talk schedule. Let's talk actual Duke hoops. Let's do it. Okay. Weird. So last, I guess not last Sunday, but a couple Sundays ago on the 19th, I believe, uh, Duke released their non-conference schedule now a lot of people are waiting for the full schedule to come out but we at least have half of it uh in the non-conference schedule uh i I won't go into the entire schedule i'll let you guys highlight on some of the uh big matchups but uh, for me the major matchup uh as we know uh in the big 10 acc challenge on december 2nd we will have a home game against indiana who is slated to be pretty good i believe in the top 10 or 15 uh in the preseason ranking so far um there are some other uh big matchups coming up uh including the uh sweet 16 uh rematch uh with utah um we will be playing them in the garden uh is in the garden or is in in barclays i'm not entirely sure it's in the garden madison square garden Garden. Garden Garden on december 19th um that'll be our home away from home game in new york city so uh i will start with you jason uh your takeaways from the non-conference schedule that we have well, you, uh, you, you left out the biggest one. Um, uh, you know, Duke typically, uh, I think, you know, either through the uh, Big Ten ACC Challenge or, or for, through something else, um, typically gets a top five opponent. And we got one in Kentucky um, on November 17th at the United Center in Chicago 
which is one of those many sort of home away from homes for Duke. We seem to play there every couple of years. Um, really looking forward to that matchup. I love getting Kentucky early in the year. Feels like this has happened for us a lot lately. I, I know that Kentucky's part of that um, Champions Classic that Michigan State and us are in, and Kansas is the other team in it. But it feels like we get Kentucky more than we get the other guys in that Champions Classic. I got no problem with that because um, when we get them early in the year, it's before their all-freshman team has – begun to really gel and, and come together. Although, you know, Kentucky next year is going to be a, a much more experienced team than usual. Alex Poitras will be a senior. Um, uh, they've got a, you know, a couple guards who have some experience. Hang um, on. Can I, can I, can I cut you off real quick? We please. were talking about, we were talking about guys who had all the potential in the world and then, and then it all just changed. How about Alex Poitras? I mean, that's well, injury. Guy that, well, right. But we remember, remember us freaking out about, about, you know, giving, the scholarship offer and then not being able to go through with it and they had that that weird like secondary recruiting violation i mean that was a guy who was who was supposed to be like the the linchpin of whatever class he was in um and now he's still at kentucky as a senior granted it is injuries but anyway continue sorry yeah yeah it, it is injuries um but he's a great player he, he you yeah. know he, he's gonna be one of the best seniors in the country next year there's little question about that um, assuming he's able to come back from his injuries uh, you know the non-conference slate i sort of thought it's uh, to me, it's a little, a little tiny bit down from what we sometimes see um, in terms of the big, big marquee opponents. Other than Kentucky, I don't think there's another one that that will be a preseason top ten. You mentioned Indiana is going to be top ten, top fifteen. I think they'll be top fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think Utah will. Utah may be at the back end of the top twenty-five um, uh, in the, uh, the the preseason tournament that we're in. Um, we will. We will get either Wisconsin or Georgetown or Virginia Commonwealth. Um, Georgetown probably be the highest rated of those. Again, maybe top 20 or so, but we don't really have that many teams that you go, oh, well, that team's a real national title contender. And so in that regard, I think it's a little tiny bit of a step down, but something that, you know, I think maybe goes overlooked a little bit, um, the, the, the sort of lesser known opponents that we're playing are really good. I mean, we've yeah. got Yale, who who's the number two team in the Ivy and, and, and you know, a team that wins 20 is going to win 20 games for sure next year. Utah State, which is a team that sometimes threatens to win 30 games. They're the best team in their conference year after year after year. Georgia Southern is really on the rise and a very good team. Buffalo, Bobby Hurley just came from there. But boy, Buffalo was, a, you know, a, a strong NCAA tournament team last year. Um, it, the only two teams we have on our schedule who did not have winning records last year are Long Beach State and Elon. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Actually, we may have added two teams for that, for the, you know, for the early season um, uh, tournament that we're in. Yeah. yeah, for the exempt tournament. I think we have two lousy teams for that tournament. But um, right. for the most part, the teams that we sort of could voluntarily schedule, even the teams that aren't high-profile BCS conference teams, we picked some of the best mid-majors out there. And, and, and I really like that aspect of it. So what we're missing to me in – the big name marquee matchups we're making up for in some really compelling other matchups that could be a real challenge. Yeah, and I think that we did a lot of the things that we normally do. Like you said, we we scheduled the hard mid-major opponents, which I think has been one of the sort of underrated standout factors of our schedule in years past. We took a top 20-ish type team in Utah for our for our annual trip to New York. We have Kentucky in the Champions Classic. We have one of the best teams in the um in the Big Ten in Indiana. I mean, Maryland is projected to be better, but we're not necessarily projected to be the best team in the ACC. That's probably North Carolina at this point. So they they got Maryland, right? I, I think I remember. Yes, they correctly. did. They did. Yes. So yeah. we did all the things we normally do. I think that the only thing that's bringing it down is that is that we're in this exempt, the exempt tournament that we're in. The programs that are there are all programs that have had recent success, maybe not Georgetown as much, but Wisconsin and, and VCU have been really competitive teams the last few years. They're just seeing huge drop-offs. Wisconsin, obviously, is losing most of their production in Kaminsky and Decker going to the draft and, and a lot of other guys graduating. And then VCU obviously lost their coach, Shaka Smart. He's now at Texas. So who knows what's going to happen with them now? I, I don't think that we did anything out of the ordinary. You know, everything everything kind of lines up the way it way it normally does but as you point out really outside of Kentucky and maybe Indiana depending on how you feel about them there isn't that you know we don't have that wow factor but there are still plenty of opportunities for us to get good wins against teams that are going to have uh strong resumes and and ultimately our strength of schedule is still going to be good because I think the ACC is going to be really good again next year so 
I, I like our non-conference schedule. I think we got interesting opponents. I mean, you know, we got to play Utah this past year in the tournament, but that's a team that has that, that center in Pirtle who, who, you know, I enjoyed watching. Um, and, He's going to be a lottery and, pick. He's a lottery pick yeah. for sure. And we're going to see him again. We don't have, and we don't have Okafor um, to force him into foul trouble. like We did last year. Uh, he's going to be going against like Emil Jefferson or MP3 so, baby MP3. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> So I think there's a lot of interesting games on the schedule. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I'm I'm happy about it. I think they did. I think they did as well as they could. You know, knowing that the exempt tournament ended up in a, in sort of a weird spot where we got good programs who just happen to not be projected as as good as they normally are for next year. Yeah. So I I I, I think that other than Kentucky, which you know, honestly, I I went to the first three uh, Champions Classics, and so at this point, it kind of feels like it's part of the schedule, which is kind of why I didn't, I kind of overlooked it when I was, you know, recapping the schedule, the, the strength of it. Uh, you know, I feel like we saw Poitras his freshman year along with Nerlens the well in, uh, in Atlanta. And I feel like that was only a couple years ago, but it was four years ago. So uh, I, I think that is always something that's going to be good, but it seems like as good what's good about the schedule is that we're seeing teams that we don't really see very often. We're not playing Utah. We're not playing Utah state a lot. We're not playing Yale and Buffalo. So I think those kind of games are, are, are get people's interest. Uh, and I think that's what's going to kind of get people excited about the schedule. D- Donald, by the way, you need to stop with, you know, I know you're a drug dealer on the side. The cops just seem to be coming by your house, like nonstop, man. Look, the, 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 the vice president was enjoying the game with me. Uh, well, not with me, but he was also watching the game. And, you know, they're really excited, too. So so the I think they're doing a couple laps around my building. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guys, you know, we talked about the non-conference schedule. We actually know the conference schedule as well. I think the conference schedule shapes up really nicely for Duke. The four teams that we play twice, the teams that we have home and away, we know North Carolina every year. We have NC State. First time we've had them home and away in a while. We have Wake Forest and Louisville. Um, you know, certainly Louisville is going to be good. I don't know if they'll be as good as they were last year. Um, they, they, they also lost a pretty good portion from their team. They, they've got some decent recruits coming in. but um, And Carolina's, you know, a lot of people think is going to be the class of the ACC this year. At least that's what the preseason projections. Um, uh, but they are great the, at disappointing. They are great at disappointing. Um, <laughs> but, but the other teams that we play on the road are Boston College, Clemson, Georgia Tech, Miami, and Pittsburgh. It's really, you know, that's not the class of the ACC. The teams we get at home only are Florida State, Notre Dame, Syracuse, Virginia, and Virginia Tech. Other than Virginia Tech, I love those home matchups. Those, you know, if I was playing Florida State, Notre Dame, Syracuse, Virginia only on the road, I'd be really frustrated. I'd be very worried. Instead, we get those guys all at home, and, and, and we're getting, you know, Boston College, Georgia Tech, Clemson, Miami, and Pittsburgh at home. I, I'm hey, sorry, on the road. I think it, it shapes up pretty nicely for us. Where are we playing Maryland this year? Yeah, we ain't playing Maryland. They ain't oh. in the conference anymore, buddy. Gone. Oh, no, totally Bye-bye. forgot about that. I'm sorry. Was that a joke or were you serious? <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm very aware of Maryland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, they're going to be tough next year. They might be the best team in the ACC. Oh, wait, just kidding. Yeah, no, they're not. So I, I think the ACC schedule shapes up pretty nice for us, um, at, you know, in addition to um, – the non-conference slates, you know, it's going to come down to our games against Carolina bastards. Is that, is that appropriate for this podcast? Am I we'll allow, that word? we'll allow it. We'll allow it. I don't think, I don't think we know. I don't think we know. Hey, it's a B bomb, not an F bomb. I think B bombs are okay. Do we have the, do we have the, do we have any rules or I don't know what the rules are of this place. There are no rules when it comes, when, it, when, when you're in the off season. So <laughs> there are no true. rules, <laughs> especially when it comes to UNC, there are zero rules. That's true. Hey, I think okay. I think we just segue. I think we just segued to uh, Chaz Surratt, didn't we? Segway. I, may, may I start? May I start? Go ahead. Take it. Take the All reins. Right. So here's what happened. Um, there's a phenomenon in football recruiting that we're as Duke fans maybe not as familiar with because we follow the high level basketball recruiting, but until you know the last couple of years, the football recruiting hasn't been on a level where it's been you know in the in the top tier of the nation, and even still, it's not like we're we're competing with Alabama for every kid. Um, and, Although and we, we get some, never. we've gotten. Hey, we've gotten some but kids we have, that we're looking at. We Alabama. have gotten some. That's true. Um, but so we had a commitment from a high-profile quarterback recruit named Chaz Surratt. Uh, I might be saying his last name wrong, uh, but he committed to Duke. I think a couple months ago. Was really excited about it. He was invited to a number of 
major uh, summer camps for quarterbacks. And then recently, I think it was last week, decided to flip and uh, commit to North Carolina instead. And he and his dad were quoted as saying that it sounds like North Carolina's football team is going to not be punished so severely for the academic scandal and that they're going to sort of get out of it unscathed and that, and that jazz is going to have a great time being in Carolina and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, man, what a bunch of baloney they fell for. Uh, I feel bad for this kid because he had an opportunity to come play for David Cutcliffe and he, and he initially decided he was going to do that. And now he's going to a program where I, whatever, whatever the coaching staffs at the football program and the basketball program are telling recruits of Carolina, they have no idea what's going to happen to them. And liars. They're, they are liars. And, they are and liars. Since the time, and since the last time we recorded, uh, UNC released the notice of allegations. It took them a couple of days to uh, to scrub it of a bunch of information before they released it to the public. But they look bad. They, and and you know we we saw what happened to Syracuse. They they lost a bunch of wins. They had to. They're forfeiting a postseason. They're losing scholarships. All the things that can happen. And the stuff with Carolina seems like it's worse. They have all the lack of institutional control. The thing goes across different sports and and many years and all this stuff that was I, I think he was as you say he was lied to um, by the Carolina coaching staff. They have no idea what, what's going to happen to them. They don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, the Syracuse thing got dragged out over the course of almost an entire academic year, I think. And the UNC thing is much bigger. So you know, even though he's not going to be coming until a year from now to Carolina. Um, the sanctions may not start until next summer. So maybe his first couple of years, they're going to be on, on probation or, or not being able to play in the postseason and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they'll, you know, if they, if they somehow manage to win the coastal division, they'll still give out rings and t-shirts and stuff for it. But um, it, it was, it's a weird move on his part. And it's unfortunately in the, in the grander scheme for Duke, you know, I don't, I think Jason likes to talk about UNC more than I do, but in the grander scheme for Duke, this is kind of a thing that we have to get used to as we get a higher profile football program that we're going to get commitments from kids who are going to ultimately decide to back out of their verbals and, and ends up in other places. And Cutcliffe tries to, it seems like tries to make an effort to recruit kids who that's not going to happen to, but the football recruiting world is so much murkier and, and stranger than, than the basketball world where all the guys are playing each other all the time. And they, and all the top guys know each other because they're at, they're at camps together and they're, their high schools are, they all go to elite high schools. They play each other. The football world is, is so much more complicated and, and, and deep that this is, this is, I guess, just the kind of stuff that happens, but man, poor Chaz Surratt uh, going to play Carolina and no idea what's going to happen to them. Jason, did you want to uh, give Wait, the, the before, back? before we let, before we let Jason okay. cook, because I know yeah, he's, yeah, gonna, yeah. I know he's about I, to, I, 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 I know feel, he's about I to grill. Feel, about uh, to, we're going to unleash the beast in just a second. Before I've that, never, I want to, I've never met Jason, but I can, I can see the the like veins popping out of his forehead right now. I'm yeah. foaming. Gonna, I'm foaming at the mouth. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna let we're gonna we're gonna let the we're gonna let the beast oh, loose in just a second. Before that, uh, I, I want to point out that apparently UNC uh, uh, also offered him, or, or Roy Williams apparently called Chaz Surratt and offered him a spot as preferred walk on on the basketball team, and that kind of helped sway him to uh, decommit from Duke. Uh, he's to gonna go lose to Duke USC. a ton over his time. He Carolina. he he's gonna be <laughs> he's gonna be getting it in all levels in every sport. If he wants to play baseball, we probably could give it to him in that too. Uh, shout out to the baseball team. Hopefully, you guys can do better. Um, but I, I think that the one issue is this for me is that uh, he is being fed a bunch of. Uh, a, I don't know if we have sensors on this thing, a bunch of BS. Like he he's and somehow he's falling for it. And, and I don't know how that's possible. And I think in my mind, if you can fall for UNC getting, what was it? A 600 page, 700 page notice of allegations. And out of those 700 pages say, Oh, we're clean football team. Ain't going to be touched. Neither will the basketball team. If you believe that, then I mean, good luck to you. Like I, I, I don't know what to tell you because that is just that's just ridiculous. So with that, the beast is loose. Jason, go to work. Okay, so, so you guys basically said most of the stuff that I was going to say. I don't want to be, I don't want to be mean to Chaz Surratt and to his family. And by the way, um, Donald, you mentioned Chaz getting a preferred walk-on spot. Um, Carolina also promised 
uh, Chaz's younger brother, uh, who is, I believe, currently a high school sophomore, maybe rising junior, who also plays basketball and is a fairly good basketball player. They promised that his brother could also walk on the UNC basketball team. I guess neither one of them are good enough basketball players to really be recruited by UNC, but but they're both going to get preferred walk-on spots. Someone, by the way, on the board, I believe, pointed out that um, if if you're offering a walk-on position to his brother, is that like an illegal benefit or something like that, but it's not. So that's just being silly. Um, I, I don't, I, there are a lot of people who've said some really negative, bad things about Chaz Surratt. Uh, after what Donald just said about people buying into this line that Carolina is not going to be punished. Uh, I, you know, I think it'd be very easy to crack a joke that Chaz, if he believes that isn't smart enough to go to Duke, but I'm not going to make that joke. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to rise above you it. You just did it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> no, I, look, the, this, the, the kid made his decision. It's fine. Um, I think even if he changed his mind, uh, I, I've heard from sources that Duke wouldn't take him back at this point. Um, uh, it's not like he's the most important recruit we've ever we've ever gotten or anything like that. Uh, it's not like the program isn't doing a great job in recruiting. And look, we'll find another uh, quarterback recruit that we can get. Um, we and and our current roster of quarterbacks is is fairly solid. Um, but what what I want to talk about, what really bothers me, is the out and out lies that North Carolina, both Roy Williams and Larry the Hat Fedora are, are saying to recruits. Um, they are telling these recruits that, that their lawyers believe, um, UNC's lawyers think that both men's basketball and football will get off scot-free um, in the, uh, uh, from the NCAA. I think Roy even said, oh, men's basketball was only mentioned once in the entire notice of allegations. Well, that's sort of, it's a silly comment. Because the nature of the NOA was not to call out specific sports. It was to call out all kinds of different acts and the, and the pattern of malfeasance that went on across numerous, numerous sports. And the UNC redacted the names of all the, pl- of all the players who were involved in this. So we don't know how many times basketball would have been mentioned if they hadn't redacted Rashad McCants name and, 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 you know, Ray Felton's name and everybody else from UNC who clearly took these classes um, that were complete BS. Uh, so, uh, oh, and by the way, the one time basketball and football are mentioned is in like the main list of allegations where it says this entire scheme, this entire thing that this 900 page report is about was primarily aimed at helping football, men's basketball, and women's basketball. So yeah, Roy, you're right. You're only mentioned once, buddy, but you're mentioned as the whole underpinning of the entire thing. It's complete and utter BS. Carolina is just lying to kids, but I would point out there's no incentive for them to tell the truth. If they were to actually tell the truth and say to these kids, yeah, we, we, we don't know what's going to happen because that's the truth. Anyone who says to you they know Carolina is going to get hammered or they know Carolina is going to get off scot-free is lying. No one knows. We can make educated guesses. We can look at what's in the NOA. We can look at what was in the Weinstein report. We can look at what happened to Syracuse and some other schools and say, okay, it looks like this is about what's going to happen, but we don't know for a fact what's going to happen. Carolina we claims just, they know. I was going to say the, the, other, the other route you could take is you could put on your, uh, your Pac Pride branded tinfoil hat and, and just wait the whole thing out by staring at flowcharts. Yes, yes, you, you could do that. But I was going to say, there's no incentive for Carolina to tell the truth because if they told the truth and said, we don't know, these kids wouldn't commit because these kids would, would be concerned that Carolina maybe is going to about, about to go on two, three, four plus years of probation potentially. Or, or, you know, so there's no, there's no reason for Carolina to tell the truth. And there's every reason for them to lie because if they come back, if the NCAA comes back and, and hammers Carolina, it's not going to be until after – these recruits have all already, it's not going to be till the spring probably. So all these recruits right now that they're talking to will have already signed, will have already committed to Carolina. And at that point, Roy just goes, oh gosh, you know what? The lawyers told me we'd be fine. Fedora says, hey, uh, we really thought it was going to be okay. Oh, well. Uh, and, and at that point, there's nothing that these recruits can do. I mean, in theory, I guess Carolina could release them and they could go elsewhere. But if Carolina had told the truth, the kids would have gone elsewhere anyway. So I, I don't like it. I think it's dishonest. I'm really disappointed in UNC that they're doing that. I don't know that they have much choice because their recruiting has sucked. It's been so bad lately that they sort of have to start to lie because they they know that you know they've got no choice because they're not going to get kids otherwise. Uh, but it's unfortunate, and I really feel for kids who are falling for it, um, like Chaz Surratt and like his family. Well, um, compare Surratt – Compare Surratt to Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram basically said 
I would have committed to Carolina, but we, we really just don't know what's going to happen. Um, and, and you can look at the whole state of their basketball recruiting and you can tell that, that there are kids who are figuring it out that know that, that the future is uncertain there. Yeah. Well, by the way, the, the big difference of course is Brandon Ingram is looking at what's my team going to do next year because Brandon Ingram yeah. thinks he's going to be one and done, you know, maybe two and done. Brandon Ingram is, in basketball, you're in school for a very, very short period of time. Football is the exact opposite. Chaz Surratt knows he's going to be at UNC for three years and more like minimum it, four or five. Yeah, more like it four or five because in football, everybody red shirts their first year. So, I mean, look, if Chaz Surratt's looking around and goes, oh, you know what? Caroline's probably going to get hit with a year or two of probation. By the time Chaz Surratt is really playing for North I mean, he's probably not going to start as a freshman. It's not like he's that great. And Carolina has a, a pretty good number of good football – I'm sorry, good quarterback prospects on the roster. If Chaz Surratt's looking at starting, hopefully, as a sophomore or a junior, I mean, even if Carolina gets two or three years of probation, it won't really affect him that much. Yeah, you're right. And by the way, last thing I want to talk about regarding this uh, football recruiting and, and guys flipping, um, I'm not sure if you guys heard about this, but um, just a few days after Chaz Surratt got stolen away by North Carolina, UGA, University of Georgia, one of the top football programs in the country, tried to go after a 6'8 offensive lineman that we had recruited, a guy named Robert Kraling, who uh, a scout recently elevated from a three-star to a four-star recruit. There are, there are folks who think he's one of the top – 200, 250 players in the country, regardless of position. This guy is clearly one of the best recruits Duke football has gotten in a long, long time. And the fact that UGA, which is always among one of the top five or 10 schools in the country in terms of recruiting, came after him. After Duke, after he committed Duke, they said, hey, we want you to, he's from Georgia. And they said, we want you to come play for the Bulldogs. They offered him a scholarship. And Robert Kraling's response was, Guys, um, I'm I'm committed to Duke. I'm going to be quite happy playing at Duke. So, as much as we hate Chaz Surratt, <laughs> Robert Kraling is my new favorite Duke football recruit. Thanks, Robert. It. You made the right decision. Okay, I love I, it. Hey, have, have okay. we gotten the Jason take? Are we are, are we cooling down now? Yeah, we're cooling down a little bit, just a little bit. <sighs> I'm I'm glad. I'm glad you got that off your chest, man. I know Thank it's you. been. I, I know it's been. I know it's been in there. So if you have hate in your heart, you got to let it out. Sometimes you got to, sure. you got to feed, got to feed the beast. So uh, yeah, it, it's not, it, it's not hate. It's that I'm angry that Carolina is perhaps honest. This, yes. It, it's this day. I, 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 hate, this day. I hate the dishonesty and the cheating. Um, you guys know me. I, I, I want Carolina to be good because I think it's good for the Duke Carolina rivalry. And what I hate, what's really driven me crazy lately. And the reason I've been on these rants is they are being dishonest. They, they were dishonest for 18 years and they perpetrated this scam. They've been dishonest in the way they've dealt with the scam. Um, and that, that bothers me. I don't mind if they're good on the floor, if they're good in an honest way. But the dishonesty is what really has me pissed off. I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, why don't we move on to something a little more uh, – let's talk about UNC a little bit more, but in kind of a more jovial – uh, aspect. Uh, in, in case a lot of you have not visited the boards in a while, there is a really funny tread uh, on there that is titled Who Hates UNC the Most? And it's basically uh, a bunch of people uh, talking about their reasons why they hate UNC more than any other poster on the Duke Basketball Report. Uh, I will kick it to you, Sam. You've been following this tread a lot. What are What have you been seeing in there? It's been pretty funny so far. It is. And, and you know, I'm kind of an interesting case because I'm not a DBR original. I only found the site like five or six years ago. And then I became a moderator, I think, a year and a half or two years ago or so. So I'm somewhat new to the site. I don't know, like the whole Noob! Of, Noob! Where you, yeah, where you people all came. I know, I'm like totally spoiled. I've been there for six years. I've seen two <laughs> championships. Um the, the year I joined was the year that we won the championship back in 2010. Uh, like it was like that fall of that year. Um, By the way, I still can't believe that we started the podcast the year we won a national title. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's great. What are one we going to do one. next year? It's true. Uh, Unreal. But, uh, but I, I'm, I'm loving it. I, you know, I, I've met a couple of the people that are in there uh, who are vying for the title. I know that I, I know that I've met Devil Deke at a, at a football tailgate. I know that I met Wheezy at the national championship game. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of crazy people. Uh, who participate a lot on the forum and are are wonderful people from what I've met at least in real life, um, and it's a lot of fun. If you enjoy reading the forum, you really should be in there and paying attention to it because it's because it's great fun and there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting characters around. 
So I'm I'm glad that it's going on. I don't know who I'm. I, yeah, it's it's not clear if it's going to end up actually end up you know being a vote or something. So I, I don't know who I'm going to pick yet. But there are a lot of, there are a lot of good contenders. I know Jason's gotten some attention in it for uh, for some of his UNC rants, some of which have appeared on the podcast, some of which have appeared in the in the forum. So we'll see uh, we'll see how it plays out. It's a it's sort of a classic off season discussion for us to be having. Yeah, as yeah. I've said, I, I I don't hate UNC. Um, I just hate what they've been lately. Uh, but I, I haven't checked out that thread. I need to check out that thread. You you really belong in there. There's there's so I, much good material, you know. And and sometimes I think on the boards, you know, we don't. I don't think we talk about the about the discussion in the boards maybe as much as as much as we should in this podcast. Um, the discussion in this in here is like is like classic textbook DVR stuff has occasionally strayed into the punny, you know, people trying to outwit each other, but then a lot of it just comes back to the same, like Carolina hate that everybody likes to spew. So it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's probably one of the best threads that we've seen since the, since the season ended, you know, outside of like the ongoing national championship game uh, post game thread that, that continues to appear on the front page. Yeah. And I think the best part about the trend is not like, you know, every DBR poster ever is chiming and say, Oh, who hates the UNC the most? That's clearly me. There's people who are nominating other people like, yo, this guy, I thought I hated UNC, but this dude over here hates him some UNC. Yeah, like, like shout out to Moon Pie. Don't know who you are, <laughs> but you hate UNC a lot. I know that you are you are a key nominee here in this race. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Ozzy as well. Ozzy has been 9-effing UNC oh, for man. decades. So no one, like, no one hates like Ozzy. No one like, hates like that is my top seed in the bracket right now. He's got a strong case. <laughs> I, I, I will admit that he's got a strong case. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't even chime in because once people started nominating other people, I was like, well, this is a wrap. Like, I, I need to focus on other other races that I could probably win. This is not one of them. Uh, yeah. But it was it was really it was hilarious. Um, okay, so I, I haven't read it yet. Are there any Princess Bride references in it? Has someone said the word inconceivable? Because it's not a. There have been a number of, I mean, like a lot of the classic things that end up coming up on DVR all the time have have showed up in that thread. So, like I said, it's got all the elements that you would expect. It, it's it's not a true DVR thread until we start quoting from the Princess Bride. I mean, as I've <laughs> as I've as I've pointed out, I think most of my reputation comments on the DVR forum have come from Monty Python references. So, um, I'm 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 all in on that stuff. Yeah, there we go. You know, hey, by the way, while we're doing shout outs, um. I do want to bring up uh, one poster who's fairly new to the DBR. Um, people, if you happen to check out the thread on the Carolina scandal, um, uh, it's currently titled with the the Sacks giving UNC one year of probation. But you know it, the title sort of changes when there's new news. But the UNC athletic scandal thread, there, there's a guy named Swood one thousand S W O O D one thousand who is just bringing the knowledge in that thread. I think his posts are incredibly well-researched. Uh, I say he, I don't know if it's a he, it could be a she. Uh, whoever it is, uh, if you do nothing but read that person's posts, analyzing what's been going on with the NCAA, with NCAA rules, and how it impacts Carolina and Carolina's punishment, um, you, you can get an incredible education just by reading what that one poster is writing. He's got like maybe 300 or 400 posts to his credit so far. Um, and, and he's already, I think he's one of the smartest posters on the board. So shout out from me to Swood1000 for really doing a great job in the Carolina scandal thread. Nice. I like it. Let's, I think that's all we got. No, do you guys have anything to wrap up, uh, Sam? Uh, let's see a couple things. Number one, shout out to my second alma mater, the university of Denver, who won the, lacrosse championship i am now a three-year running uh, lacrosse champion between duke and university of denver uh, i had a couple other notes here syracuse named mike hopkins as their uh, officially named him as their coach in waiting for three years from now when Bayheim finally retires we'll see how that goes um uh, the the program at syracuse may take a dive very quickly and the other thing the other news that came out recently was bo ryan's retiring um you know that this past year, unfortunately for him, was probably his best shot at a championship. The team this year is not going to be as good. I mean, they're they're still going to be talented, but they're probably not going to be nearly on the level that they were this past season. But he's had an incredible coaching career. He's been 
nominated for the Naismith Hall of Fame at least once. I know this past season he will probably end up in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He's done an incredible job at Wisconsin. So shout out to him. I don't think any, I think we cover the rest of the stuff that was interesting to me, but uh, I just wanted to reiterate that it was nice to hear from you guys again. I'm glad that in the waning minutes of June, we managed to get one podcast in in June because we got one in in May. We got one in in June and you know, by the time late July rolls around, it's gonna be it's gonna be training camp for our football boys. So we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to do some previews. Maybe we'll maybe we'll bring on uh, some of the uh, some of the football people who are on the on the forum to talk a little football with us. So I'm looking forward to that a lot. I got one game I think I'm going to this year that I've got booked up. So we'll see uh, we'll see what goes on in the future. But Jason, what would you add anything? Yeah, you know, speaking of football, my parting shot. Um, I believe was just announced today. Lakin Tomlinson, the Duke's All-American offensive lineman, Lakin Tomlinson, yes, was named ACC Athlete of the Year. Um, first wow. of all, huge, huge congrats! Huge congrats to him. That's a big. That's a really big deal honor. Um, I mean, when you think about all the uh, all the players who play different sports in the ACC, all the uh, you know all the championships won by ACC teams um, for a Duke football player to win ACC athlete of the year. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it really, it really is impressive. I don't know Duke's history at, at having the ACC play, uh, player of the year, athlete of the year, I should say. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm reading the article. He's the 13th blue devil to ever win it. But, but the list of the other guys, Art Heyman, Jeff Mullins, Danny Ferry, Clarkston Hines, who, by the way, lived in my hall freshman year. Clarkston Hines, wide receiver on the football team. Christian Leitner won um, ACC Athlete of the Year. Elton Brand, Shane Battier, J.J. Redick. It's not a lot of football guys. And Ned Crotty won it in 2010. Uh, a, huge, a huge thing for a Duke football player. It, it, you know, after where Duke football was for the, for the 90s and most of the 2000s, almost all the 2000s, uh, for a Duke footballer, uh, alignment to an ACC Athlete of the Year. Wow. I, I'm standing up and saluting right now. It is, it's really, really impressive. I can't wait to see him in a Lions uniform. Um, it's it's going to be great to see this fall. Um, I, I just really can't wait. But uh, I, I think my only parting shot would be, uh, I, I, once again, I, it's great to hear from you guys again. It's been, it's been quite a while, and uh, it's, it's been good to – catch up on the on the world of duke football basketball and just life in general and once again i will send a shout out to the u.s women's national soccer team good luck to you guys and and we're we're, i'll be cheering hard for you uh from here in dc if again if you're in dc laugh man tavern is where you want to be sunday afternoon and evening so is that it guys i'm good we're done all right well Thank you guys for listening. It's been uh, quite a while, and we, we thank you guys for tuning back in to the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We will check you out in a couple weeks, hopefully. But until then, Duke Band, take us out.